first uh, monetary policy statement of the current financial year 2024-25 and uh, this is how it goes. As you would be aware, earlier this week we commemorated the 90th year of the Reserve Bank of India. The journey of this august institution is closely related to the evolution of the Indian economy. Numerous historic events have occurred during these nine decades. And they consist of the nationalization of the Reserve, nationalization of the reserve Bank in 1949, the planning era, bank nationalization, wars, droughts, the fall of the Bretton Woods system, oil shocks, a precarious balance of payment situation and the subsequent market reforms, the Asian and the global financial crisis, the taper tantrum, and finally the COVID-19 pandemic and the geopolitical hostilities of the recent years. During this journey, the Reserve Bank was always at the forefront, combining its developmental and regulatory roles in steering the Indian financial system and the economy towards stability. While doing so, the Reserve Bank has discharged its responsibility with integrity and professionalism. Compared to many other central banks, the Reserve Bank has a much broader range of functions which is vital for ensuring macro-financial stability of a modern and complex economy like India. There are functional complementarities among the various responsibilities of the Reserve Bank of India. Being a full-service central bank, the Reserve Bank is well positioned to take a holistic view of various critical issues confronting the economy and the financial sector, and it's also well positioned to take appropriate steps in the best interest of the economy. We continuously strive to learn, adapt, and innovate while performing our multiple responsibilities. I would now like to focus on the decisions and deliberations of the Monetary Policy Committee meeting, which uh, met on 3rd, 4th, and today, uh, 5th of April. After a detailed assessment of the evolving macroeconomic and financial developments and the outlook, the Reserve Bank MPC decided by a majority of 5 to 1 to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. Consequently, the standing deposit facility, that is the SDF, rate remains at 6.25% and the marginal standing facility, that is the MSF rate, remains at 6. Point MSF rate and the bank rate, they remain at 6.75%. The MPC also decided by a majority of five out of six members to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation progressively aligns to the target while supporting growth. I shall now briefly set out the rationale for these decisions. Since the last policy, the growth inflation dynamics have played out favorably. Growth has continued to sustain its momentum, surpassing all projections. Headline inflation has eased to 5.1% during both January and February. And this has come down to 5.1% in these two months from the earlier peak of 5.7% in the month of December. Core inflation has also declined steadily over the past nine months to its lowest level in the series. The fuel component of CPI remained in deflation for six consecutive months. Food inflation pressures, however, accentuated in February. Looking ahead, robust growth prospects provide the policy space to remain focused on inflation and ensure its descent to the target of 4%. As the uncertainties in food prices continue to pose challenges, the MPC remains vigilant to the upside risks to inflation that may derail the path of disinflation. 
Under these circumstances, monetary policy must continue to be actively disinflationary to ensure anchoring of inflation expectations and fuller transmission of the past monetary policy actions. The MPC therefore decided to keep the policy rate unchanged at 6.5% in this meeting and also remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation. The MPC will remain resolute in its commitment to aligning inflation to the target. I would now like to provide an assessment of growth and inflation and I will begin with uh, the scenario relating to global growth. The global economy has remained resilient with a stable outlook as reflected in various high frequency indicators. Now in my statement, you know, whatever I am saying, it is backed up with a lot of data which are there in the footnotes. So those of you who are interested could refer to this statement which as usual will be uploaded in, our, in the RBI website immediately after this statement is over. So a lot of data backing up whatever I am saying is available in the footnote of, in the various footnotes of my statement. You may like to refer to it. Let me start again uh, on the global growth part. The global economy has remained resilient with a stable outlook as reflected in various high frequency indicators. Global trade is expected to grow faster in 2024, although weaker than its historical average. Inflation is moving closer to targets, but the last mile of dis disinflation is turning out to be challenging. Services inflation in advanced economies remains sticky amidst tight labor markets. Accordingly, central banks are cautious in their communications, thereby tempering market expectations about the timing and magnitude of interest rate cuts later during this year. Equity markets have gained while bond yields and the US dollar have remained volatile. The overall outlook is challenged by continuing geopolitical conflicts, disruptions in trade routes and high public debt burden. In the last monetary policy statement, if you recall, I had expressed concerns about the high levels of public debt in both advanced and emerging market economies, that is the EMEs. These are dormant risks which could erupt abruptly. Debt to GDP ratio which rose during the pandemic remain elevated and are projected to increase further with rising interest burden and cost of borrowing, thus raising debt sustainability concerns. Worsening debt situation in advanced economies in particular can generate spillovers for the emerging market economies in the form of swings in capital flows and volatility in financial markets. The emerging market economies with rising levels of public debt in particular would be vulnerable to these spillover effects. Credible fiscal consolidation plans, particularly in major advanced economies, focusing on growth enhancing investment would be necessary to address this challenge, not only for themselves, but also I think for the overall global economy. India, however, presents a different picture on account of its fiscal consolidation and faster GDP growth. Turning to domestic growth, the domestic economic activity continues to expand at an accelerated pace, supported by fixed investment and improving global environment. The second advance estimates placed the real GDP growth at 7.6% for 2023-24, the third successive year of 7% or higher growth. From the supply side, industrial activity led by manufacturing continued its momentum. The Purchasing Managers Index, that is PMI for manufacturing, displayed a sustained expansion in both February and March, touching a 16-year high in the month of March. Services sector, services sector exhibited broad-based buoyancy with all sectors within the services sector registering strong growth. The PMI services remained above 60 during February and March, suggesting sustained healthy expansion. With rural demand catching up, 
consumption is expected to support economic growth in 2024-25. Urban consumption stayed buoyant as evident from various indicators. Details are given in the footnote. The resilience in, the sim the resilience in cement production together with strong growth in steel consumption and production and import of capital goods augur well for the investment cycle to, to gain further traction. The total flow of resources to the commercial sector for, from banks and other sources at rupees 31.2 lakh crore, I repeat, at rupees 31.2 lakh crore during 2023-24 is significantly higher than that of the previous year, which was 26.4 lakh, 26 lakh crore. External demand improved in February with exports registering double-digit expansion. Trade deficit, however, widened in February as imports also accelerated. Going forward, the outlook for agriculture and rural activity appears bright. With good rubby wheat crop and improved prospects of kharif crops due to expected normal southwest monsoon. Strengthening of rural demand, improving employment conditions and informal sector activity, moderating inflationary pressures and sustained momentum in manufacturing and services sector should boost private consumption. Let me read this sentence again because there are quite a few points in this. Strengthening of rural demand, improving employment conditions and informal sector activity, moderating inflationary pressures and sustained momentum in manufacturing and services sector should boost private consumption. As per our survey, consumer confidence one year ahead reached a new high. The prospects of investment activity remained bright owing to upturn in private capex cycle becoming steadily broad based. Persisting Yeah, let me, let me just uh, rephrase it. The prospects of uh, investment activity remain bright owing to upturn in private capex cycle becoming steadily broad based. Persisting and robust government capital expenditure, healthy balance sheets of banks and corporates and rising capacity utilization and finally strengthening business optimism as reflected in our service. I think the sentence is a bit long. It's better that I read it out again for uh, greater clarity and sorry about that but I think it provides greater clarity. The prospects of investment activity remain bright owing to upturn in private capex cycle becoming steadily broad based, persisting and robust government capital expenditure, healthy balance sheets of banks and corporates, rising capacity utilization, especially in the manufacturing sector, and strengthening business optimism as reflected in our surveys. Improving global growth and trade prospects, coupled with our rising integration in global supply chains, are expected to propel external demand for goods and services. The headwinds from protracted geopolitical tensions and increasing disruptions in trade routes, however, pose risks to the overall outlook. Taking all these factors into, con into consideration, the real GDP growth for the current financial year 2024-25, which started on 1st April, the G real GDP growth for 24-25 is projected at 7%, with Q1 at 7.1%, Q2 at 6.9%, and both Q3 and Q4 at 7% each. The risks are evenly balanced. Turning to inflation, food price uncertainties continue to weigh on the inflation trajectory going forward. A record rubby wheat production would help temper price pressures and replenish the buffer stocks. As you would recall, the buffer stocks had slightly dipped, but I think the record rubby production of wheat is expected to replenish whatever depletion had taken place. Moreover, early indication of a normal monsoon augurs well for the Kharif season. International food prices also remain benign, 
the tight demand supply situation in certain categories of pulses and the production outcomes of key vegetables warrant close monitoring, especially in the background of the forecast of above normal temperatures in the coming months. And these above normal temperatures as per the current forecast are expected to prevail in April, May and June if and not beyond June, that is the current uh, forecast. Frequent and overlapping adverse climate shocks pose upside risks to the outlook on international and domestic food prices. Cost push pressures faced by firms are, seen, are seeing an upward bias after a period of sustained moderation. Deflation in fuel is likely to deepen in the near term, following the cut in LPG prices in the month of March. Notwithstanding the cut in petrol and diesel prices in mid-March, the recent uptick in crude prices, crude oil prices, especially in the recent few days, they need to be very closely monitored. Continuing geopolitical tensions also pose upside risk to commodity prices and supply chains. Assuming a normal monsoon next year, CPI inflation for, when I say normal monsoon for next year, I mean the current year 24-25. CPI inflation for the current year 24-25 is projected at 4.5%. I repeat, CPI inflation for the current year 24-25 is projected at 4.5%, with Q1 at 4.9%, Q2 at 3.8%, Q3 at 4.6%, and Q4 at 4.5%. The risks are evenly balanced. Now, what do these inflation and growth conditions mean for monetary policy? I have explained the growth situation. I have explained the inflation scenario. Synthesizing everything, what does it mean? What implications it has for monetary policy? And that is precisely what I would like to explain now. Inflation has come down significantly, but remains above the 4% target. Food inflation continues to exhibit considerable volatility, which is impeding the ongoing disinflation process. High and persistent food inflation could unhinge anchoring of inflation expectations, which is underway. Our ongoing effort is to ensure fuller transmission of policy actions and anchoring of household inflation expectations. The strong growth momentum together with our GDP projections for 24-25, give us the policy space to unwaveringly focus on price stability. Now, two years ago, around this time, when CPI inflation had peaked at 7.8% in April 2022, the elephant in the room was inflation. The elephant has now gone out, the elephant has now gone out for a walk, and appears to be returning to the forest. We would like the elephant to return to the forest and remain there on a durable basis. In other words, it is essential that, it is essential in the best interest of the economy that CPI inflation continues to moderate and aligns to the target on a durable basis. Till this is achieved, our task remains unfinished. The success in the disinflation process so far should not distract us from vulnerability of the inflation trajectory to the frequent incidence of supply side shocks. Our effort is to ensure price stability on an enduring basis, paving the way for sustained period of high growth. Uh, I would now like to turn to the aspect of liquidity and uh, financial market conditions. In the February monetary policy statement, if you recall, I had mentioned that liquidity conditions were driven by exogenous factors which were likely to correct in the foreseeable future. Liquidity conditions eased during February and March in the wake of increased government spending, Reserve Bank's market operations, and the return leg of US dollar and Indian rupee sale by auction sell by swap auction, which had been done uh, uh, earlier in uh, 2022. In particular, 
Liquidity situation improved in March with system liquidity turning intermittently surplus in the first half of the month. In these circumstances, the Reserve Bank conducted 14 fine-tuning variable rate repo operations, that is VRRR operations during February and early March to absorb intermittent surplus liquidity. Anticipating the seasonal tightening of liquidity at end March, the Reserve Bank injected liquidity through variable rate, that is VRR operations, both main and fine-tuning operations. Consequently, the average borrowings under the MSF window moderated. Liquidity conditions have, however, again turned surplus from March 30th, necessitating VRR auctions from 2nd of April. So you would have noticed in the last uh, two, three days, we, are, we have been conducting more than one VRRR auction. Uh, v triple r auctions on 2nd april then again we did it on uh, uh, 3rd april so last two three days we have been doing it and today as you know there is a variable rate uh, there is a you know uh, there is a uh, what you call uh, as per our uh, cycle we are doing uh, vrr operation for uh, 14 days a v triple r operation for 14 days now reflecting these liquidity developments the weighted average call rate, that is WACR, exhibited a softening bias and has hovered near the repo rate since the last policy meeting. In tandem, rates in the collateralized segment of the call money market have also softened. Financial conditions remained conducive as reflected in reduced term spread in the GSEC market and stable risk premium in the bond market. In the credit market, monetary policy, monetary transmission continues to be work in progress. Looking ahead, the Reserve Bank will remain nimble and flexible in its liquidity management through both main and fine-tuning operations in both repo and reverse repo. We will deploy an appropriate mix of instruments to modulate both frictional and durable liquidity so as to ensure that money market interest rates evolve in an orderly manner that preserves financial stability. The Indian rupee has remained largely range-bound as compared to both its emerging market peers and a few advanced economies during the financial year 2023-24, that is, till 31st March last. The Indian rupee was the most stable among major currencies during this period. This is very important. The Indian rupee was the most stable among major currencies during this period. As compared to previous three years, the Indian rupee exhibited lowest volatility in 2023-24. The relative stability of the Indian rupee, which I just mentioned, it reflects, I would emphasize, the relative stability of the Indian rupee reflects India's sound macroeconomic fundamentals, financial stability, and improvements in our external position. Turning to financial stability, let me say that latest data as at end December 2023 show that the key indicators of capital and asset quality of scheduled commercial banks continue to be healthy. The financial indicators of non-banking financial companies, that is NBFCs, are also in line with that of the banking system as per the latest data available. Let me emphasize, let me emphasize here that banks, NBFCs, and other financial entities must continue to give highest priority to quality of governance and adherence, adherence to regulatory guidelines. Financial sector players, by and large, operate with public money, be it of depositors in banks and select NBFCs or investors in bonds and other financial instruments. They should always be mindful of this aspect. The Reserve Bank will continue to constructively engage with financial entities in this regard. It needs to be recognized that financial stability is a joint responsibility of all stakeholders. The Reserve Bank has also been engaging with the regulated, with the regulated entities and various stakeholders for simplifying its regulations and reducing compliance burden. As part of this endeavor, the recommendations of the Regulations Review Authority, RRA2, 
2.0 constituted by the Reserve Bank have been largely implemented. The RRA 2.0 has set a new benchmark for meaningful engagement between the regulator and the regulated entities. Moving further in the same direction, internal review groups within RBI, internal review groups within RBI were formed in 2023 to rationalize, simplify and remove obsolete regulations and streamline the reporting mechanism. In pursuance of the recommendations of the RRA 2.0, that is the Regulations Review Authority, which was constituted by the RBI. So in pursuance of the recommendations of the RRA 2.0 and the internal review groups, which we constituted in 2023, more than 1,000 circulars have been withdrawn. A master direction for rationalizing and harmonizing supervisory risk returns has also been issued. The Reserve Bank will continue to follow a consultative approach and undertake review of regulations in line with the evolving financial landscape. Turning to external sector, during the first three quarters of 23-24, India's current account deficit narrowed significantly on account of a moderation in merchandise trade deficit coupled with robust growth in services exports and strong remittances. India's merchandise and services exports have grown at a healthy pace in the fourth quarter of 23-24. India continues to be the largest recipient of remittances in the world. The cost of receiving remittances is gradually coming down. Overall, the current account deficit for 2024-25 is expected to remain at a level that is both viable and eminently manageable. On the external financing side, India's foreign portfolio investment, that is FPI flows, saw a significant turnaround in 23-24. Net FPI inflows stood at 41.6 billion US dollars during 23-24, as against net outflows in the preceding two years which were in the order of 14.1 billion outflow in 21-22 and 4.8 billion outflow in 22-23. This is the second highest level of FPI inflow after 23-24. Net foreign direct investment moderated to US dollar 14.2 billion in April-January 23-24 from 25 billion a year ago. External commercial borrowings, that is ECBs, and non-resident deposits recorded higher net inflows compared to the previous year. The amount of ECB agreements also grew markedly in 2023-24 up to February 24. Now, all this data is given, details are given in the footnote. India's foreign exchange reserves reached an all-time high of 645.6 billion US dollars as of March 29th this year, March 29, 2024. I repeat, India's foreign exchange reserves reached an all time high of 645.6 billion as of March 29, 2024. Latest data on various external vulnerability indicators suggest improved resilience of India's external sector. We remain confident of meeting our external financing requirements comfortably. Now, talking about the Forex reserves, I recall that uh, in 2021, our Forex reserves had also reached 642 plus uh, billion US dollars. Then uh, following the commencement of the war in Ukraine and the outflow of uh, uh, dollar from India, as well as from several other countries on uh, safe haven demand, uh, there were concerns that Forex reserves of India was going down and at one point it had gone down. Our Forex reserves had gone down to about $524 billion. And at that time, I think several questions were raised about, uh, uh, you know, what was RBI doing, whether RBI was on the right track. If you recall, at that time, we had very clearly assured that the decline in Forex reserves was partly due to, uh, you know, the change in valuations of our assets and also partly due to our intervention in the market to ensure an orderly 
depreciation of the rupee, which is a part of our policy, ensuring orderly depreciation or orderly appreciation. And we had that time very clearly and firmly stated that we are using our forex reserves in a very judicious manner. It was a strong umbrella which we had built up and we are using it because it was raining heavily and we were mindful of what we were doing. We knew what is our purpose and in which direction we are moving. And as you would see, now the reserves have again risen and they stand at an all-time high of 642.6 billion US dollars, 645 point, not 642, sorry, 645.6 billion as of 29th March. So, you know, this is one area on which the Reserve Bank remains committed, number one, to sort of ensure that, I mean, the exchange rate of the rupee is market determined. There are inflows and outflows of dollars happening. But it is our focus, it is our prime focus to build up a strong umbrella, a strong buffer in the form of a substantial quantum of forex reserves, which will help us when the cycle turns or when it rains heavily. So let me move forward. Uh, sorry for that digression, but I thought it was necessary to set the record straight. I shall now announce certain additional measures. The first announcement relates to trading of sovereign green bonds in the International Financial Services Center, IFSC, with a view to facilitating wider non-resident participation in sovereign green bonds. A scheme for investment and trading in these bonds in the IFSC will be notified very shortly. The second announcement relates to the RBI Retail Direct Scheme and introduction of a mobile app to operate in the RBI Retail Direct Scheme. The Reserve Bank Retail Direct Scheme was launched in November 2021 for enabling the retail investors to participate in the GSEC market, both in the primary as well as in the secondary uh, market uh, auctions and operations. It is now proposed to launch a mobile app for accessing the Retail Direct portal. This will be of great convenience to retail investors and deepen the GSEC market further. The next announcement relates to review of liquidity coverage ratio, that is LCR framework. Technological developments have enabled bank customers to instantly withdraw or transfer money from their bank accounts. While improving customer convenience, this has also created challenges for banks to deal with potential situations when, due to certain factors, a large number of depositors decide to instantly and simultaneously withdraw their money from the banks. The developments in certain advanced jurisdictions in, uh, during the last year demonstrated the difficulties it can create for banks. Uh, the difficulties it can create for banks to deal with such uh, situations when there is heavy outflow of, uh, you know, heavy, heavy outflow or transfer of uh, deposits. And this happens only if that particular bank is in, a st is in an acute stress. It's not a normal thing which happens, but then the banks will have, to be remained, uh, will have to remain prepared for all eventualities. A need has therefore arisen to undertake a comprehensive review of the LCR framework for, for banks. A draft circular will be issued shortly for stakeholder consultation. Our approach is to have a balanced approach and as I said a little while ago, we follow consultative approach. So therefore, the draft circular will enable the stakeholders and the banks to give their views and opinions and suggestions, which will be taken into consideration by the Reserve Bank before arriving at a final decision. The next announcement relates to dealing in rupee interest rate derivative products for small finance banks. At present, small finance banks are permitted to use only interest rate futures for proprietary hedging. It has now been decided to allow small finance banks to use permissible rupee interest derivative products. This will allow further flexibility to small finance banks for hedging their interest rate risk and enhancing their resilience. The next announcement relates to enabling UPI for cash deposit facility. Deposit of cash through cash deposit machines, that is CDMs, is primarily being done through the use of debit cards. Given the experience gained from, from 
cardless cash withdrawal using UPI at the ATMs. It is now proposed to absorb, it is now proposed to facilitate deposit of cash in CDMs, that is in the cash deposit machines using UPI. This measure will further enhance customer convenience and make currency handling process at banks more efficient. And uh, the uh, next announcement relates to, I have two more announcements and I shall be quick. Uh, next announcement relates to UPI access for prepaid instruments through third party apps. At present, UPI payments from prepaid, uh, prepaid payment instruments, that is PPIs can be made only by using the web or mobile app provided by the PPI issuer itself. It is now proposed to permit the use of third-party UPI apps for making UPI payments from these PPI wallets. That means the PPI wallet holders no longer have to be completely dependent on the PPI issuer, but they can use any other third-party app which is operating under the uh, UPI. This will further enhance customer convenience and boost adoption of digital payments for small value transactions. And the final announcement relates to distribution of central bank digital currency, that is CBDC, the e-rupee, through non-bank payment system operators. The CBDC pilots are currently in operation with increasing number of use cases and participating banks. It is proposed to make CBDC retail accessible to a broader segment of users by enabling non-bank payment system operators to offer CBDC wallets. This will facilitate testing of resiliency of the CBDC platform to handle multi-channel transactions. Let me now conclude, and I would like to state that as we progress towards RBI at 100, the upcoming decade is going to be a transformational journey. The Reserve Bank will continue to focus on preserving financial stability and promoting a system that is robust, resilient, and future ready. And it will be robust, resilient, and future ready to support economic growth. Price stability will be a key component of this endeavor. Turning to the present, inflation is on a declining trajectory and GDP growth is buoyant. At this juncture, we should not lower our guard but continue to work towards ensuring that inflation aligns durably and sustainably to the target. Our goal, is, our goal is in sight and we must remain vigilant. We are inspired by the profound words of Mahatma Gandhi and I quote, one must persevere and have patience. Success is the inevitable result of such effort. Thank you. Namaskar.